Welcome to Maxed Out Man, helping you become the man you were made to be. Hey guys, it's Kevin Davis from the Maxed Out Man podcast. I am here today with Stephen Pivnik. Before we get started, uh, don't forget to go to maxedoutman.com. Check us out on all the social media uh, avenues. We're everywhere. Maxed Out Man, uh, just search for that or Maxed Out Man course. We got some new stuff coming out in 2024, membership courses, uh, high, high ticket coaching, that kind of thing. So go ahead and uh, check that out. Uh, give a quick bio. Steven is an international keynote speaker, best-selling author, business advisor, and serial entrepreneur. Aren't we all, right? Everybody <laughs> I talk to on this thing is, is a serial entrepreneur, which is it really awesome. Uh, specializing in the information technology market. He grew his last company, Binary Tree, to over 200 employees across 12 countries before a successful exit to a $4 billion competitor, Quest Software. That's a, that's a great exit. That's really super cool. As a trusted business advisor, Stephen partners with leaders on how to achieve similar business success and perseverance in their entrepreneurial journey. Stephen's passion for endurance sports got him to qualify and compete in the Ironman World Championship. Holy crap, I'm ready to talk about that. <laughs> Race many ultra marathons. We call you crazy people, basically, those of us that are not built for long distance running. It's um, nice time, <laughs> right. And some is some of the tallest peaks on seven continents. His blend of practical business advice and inspirational storytelling leaves the audience energized and motivated to go the distance in business and life. We're going to talk about his new book, Built to Finish, which talks about that that I just said, which compares entrepreneurship uh, with endurance athletics and how really entrepreneurship is a, is a race and a journey and marathon and all of those things. So I'm super excited to talk about that. Um, we talk, you know, I'm a fitness guy, so we talk a lot about that kind of stuff. So I'm super excited to kind of tie that in. I'm not built for running. Um, I'm not very, aer I'm not very aerodynamic, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm super excited. Steven, thanks for joining me, man. And thanks for jumping on. I know we had a little calendar snafu, so I'm glad you got done with your workout in time and, uh, and we'll have a great combo. No, no problem. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I, I love the title of your podcast. This is like right up my alley. Maxed out. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. Some people think maxed out means, you know, like totally stressed out, but it's actually like, let's maximize the potential and optimize our lives. That's kind of the, kind of the point, but Hey, thanks for, like I said, thanks for coming. I want to know kind of, you know, we got, we got some time, so I'd love to kind of get your background, how you got to where you are, how you develop kind of the challenge, the strategies based on your challenges based on your successes and just kind of give us the backstory really yeah i mean w without taking up too much time i, I came from an immigrant family my parents my i was originally born in the former soviet union what is now the ukraine a town called odessa okay. we immigrated here in 1972 i was a i was a toddler and my parents were you know very very scrappy very entrepreneurial they did what they needed to do to put food on the table so when um, I was a computer nerd growing up, my Commodore 64, which was like the first, um, you know, Dude, I, had, I had one of those with like the little uh, the, and people don't even know what a cassette tape is, but use the cassette yeah. tape as the data storage, which is crazy. Yeah, I remember exactly. doing that. <laughs> I, I still have my original one in storage someplace. I should bring it out and show people a picture. Dude, of it. That's it's cool. Wild. I mean, this this little phone here has a million times more capacity than that computer <laughs> oh ever did. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so my mother recognized my um, nerdy nature, and she gave me a pass to not go to college, but to go take a computer programming course so that I can go get a job quickly. I did that. So um, short um, after six months of learning how to program a language called COBOL, which mm -hmm. was a mainframe programming language back in the day, I got a job, and that was the beginning of my computer career. Uh, three or four years into my computer career, I got bitten by the entrepreneurial bug that was embedded in me, you know, by my parents and grandparents. Started my own company. Um, we were doing custom application development. Um, we were hired to, it was a really boring project at that time. We were hired to write a conversion utility to convert email data from one platform to another. Long story short, fast forward over 20 years, that tiny little program to convert email data mushroomed into a over 40 million dollar a year international business wow wow yeah so did a did a lot of things i mean made a da ton da of data is profitable let's just say that right <laughs> data is super profitable if a large company is converting its email systems from one to another or moving to the cloud they want to make sure their employees come in to the same inbox the same calendar same contacts right so our claim to fame was zero disruption to the end oh, wow user. all yeah. that data comes across perfectly and um, we grew a you know large business. Um, through, we did a whole bunch of other things, but that's yeah. the easiest way to describe what was the, the the foundation of our business. So 
along that journey, uh, my midlife crisis was finally recognizing that I've got some bad genes in me. Between my parents and my grandparents, they had it all. High blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, strokes, you name it, they had it. I felt that that's in me somewhere, some mm -hmm. way, someday, somehow it's going to rear its ugly head. And I want to be in the best shape possible to fight it, if and when it comes. I found out about this thing called triathlon, which prior to, prior to me learning about it, I thought it was only an Olympic sport. I'm like, how does a mere mortal do a triathlon? <laughs> I, apparently, there's a website called beginnertriathlete.com. You can find a local race in your community, short distances, train, sign up, race, boom, you're a triathlete. Wow. I did that. Um, after crossing the finish line that evening, I learned about something called Ironman and then the Ironman World Championship. And this light bulb went off my head. I'm set, I said to myself, I don't know how, someday, somehow, I'm going to cross the finish line in Kona, Hawaii. So that goal was set. So now I'm marching along two paths, right? My entrepreneurial journey with the company growing. I'm doing endurance sports, going longer and um, longer, longer distances. And when I finally accomplished both, coincidentally, 12 months apart, I said, you know what? I need to write a book to memorialize mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial journey and the endurance sports journey and offer all, you know, my personal stories as well as lessons learned and tips and tricks and motivation for other people to set large goals. And that's the built, that's built to finish, which that, I mean, I can't really think of a, of a better really analogy and connection between what we do as entrepreneurs, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, endurance obviously but it's also you know has little spurts of sprinting or you've got uphills you've got downhills right especially you and in in the case of a triathlon you've got you know biking swimming running so it's three different disciplines like i mean really that's that's amazing that you're able to put that together um is do you did you kind of see this as like an addiction for yourself like you can kind of have good addictions and bad addictions right but to become for most of those guys, most of you guys, I think it becomes a little bit of an obsession. A hundred percent. I mean, that, that's there, there's no sugarcoating it. It's definitely an obsession, addiction. Call it what you want. Um, it's an incredible dopamine hit when you cross that finish line, and once you get it, you want most. Uh, some people are one and done, and I have complete respect, you know, for somebody that sets out a goal to do a triathlon or an Ironman or a marathon, and then they're like, accomplished. I'm done. Respect. You already did more than most. But for, for most, I think it becomes a complete, for, for me especially, it became a complete addiction. And every single time I cross a finish line, no matter how much pain I'm in, within <laughs> hours, I'm like, okay, I got to do this again. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, I'm actually, I'm a, I'm a two and done guy. We did, um, we did a bunch of halves and then we decided to do a marathon here, which I'm at 4,500 feet. And then we did a marathon in Oklahoma, which is great to train at 4,500 and then go do, a, do one at like 600 feet. But after yeah. that second one, I was like, this kind of beats me up. It's not really something that I, I, you know, I was great that I could say that I did it, but I'm, I'm like, I'm six feet. I'm about 195 pounds of mostly muscle. And so, like I said, I'm not real aerodynamic. So, <laughs> and I got, I got bad IT band stuff going on. So and that's, that's excuses. It, it does intrigue me the whole triathlon thing. I've always thought that I'd have a really hard time with the swimming part of it. Yeah, I mean, the number one reason most people stay away from triathlon is the swimming. Uh, I was I was very comfortable in the water, but I was a horrible swimmer. Mm. Um, when I signed up for this first one that I mentioned, it's called a sprint distance. That only requires a 800-meter swim, which is 32 laps. Yeah. Right? Um, I couldn't do two. I went in my pool. I went back and forth, and I was exhausted for the rest of the day. I didn't have any form. I didn't have any endurance. I didn't know how to breathe properly. Went back the next day, I did three laps. Mm. Now that's a 50% increase. <laughs> and I did four laps. <laughs> and you're, you're allowed to stop in these races, right? There's buoys and there's kayakers that are there for safety. So if you get winded, you can just hold on to a kayak. As long as you're not making forward motion, you can rest. And a lot of people yeah. do. Yeah. So, But yeah, to your point, a lot of people are afraid to start because of the swimming. And it's really not that bad. <laughs> Yeah. Cause that's, I mean, and, and again, you're not what it just like in life you have strengths, right? You may, cause I know there, there are people that excel on the cycle right. or excel in the running or excel in, you know, in swimming and the guys that are, you know, top, top of the game, probably like you are, they kind of have gotten it figured out for all three, 
But, you know, just because you're not, you don't excel at all three doesn't mean you can't try it. That's yeah, it's I mean, been <laughs> on the back of my mind to, to try something like this. I don't know if I could convince myself to do it, but uh, for sure. There, there, there's so many funny, um, you know, cartoons about triathletes. And one of them is why suck at one sport when you can suck at three? <laughs> I like that. I like that. That'd probably be my story. I remember when we did the, oh, we did the Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon, which is a super cool marathon if you're looking for something like as a first goal for marathons. But I remember this little kid, he was probably like six years old. We were at like mile 19 or 20, which is like that point at which you, you go into this is, this is absolute misery. And now it's yep, pure, it's pure willpower, wall. right. To get through. But he had this poster board that said toenails are for pussies. <laughs> And like, that was like the motivation that was so funny and so motivating to finish that race. Um, and we sucked like it, we, it was my wife and I, and we were not fast or anything, which is fine. We, we can say that yeah. we did it, but it's, it, yeah. it's true. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to scare you away your viewers by showing you my toenails right now, but they, <laughs> they, they take a beating. It's a, it's a rite of passage for long distance runners. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm curious about, you know, when, when you talk about your parents and the entrepreneurial spirit you know, former Soviet Union, communist, you know, communism and all that is not exactly something you say, oh, yeah, there's probably a lot of entrepreneurs in, in that. So can you I'd love to have you explain what that means, because I can I in my mind, I can kind of put things together, you know, put two and two together yeah. and kind of walk me through that, because I think that's yeah, super I, mean, I, interesting. Only, I only remember it based on the stories that I've heard. I really didn't experience it too much other than my father took us back when I was um, 18 years old. So this is before you know, the, the wall came down mm -hmm. and the iron curtain came down. Um, so I just heard about it, you know, stories, basic, you know, premise of communism is everybody's equal. You mm -hmm. get what the government um, deems you're entitled to. Everything is rationed out, you know, from clothing to food to, you know, bare necessities. You're entitled to 1.2 rolls of toilet paper a month, <laughs> you know, four uh. boxes of cereal, or I'm just, I'm, I'm making that up. Yeah. So yeah. You either accept that or you become really, really scrappy. And you fit you you figure things out and you you figure out a way to get more than the average Joe is allowed. And I think my parents and grandparents did a great job of that. My my grandfather was in the logistics business, which mm -hmm. means he had access to goods <laughs> going back and forth from location to location. So somehow, some way, those goods some of those goods, you know, ended up in our coffers. <laughs> yeah. So I mean you you, you had to do that. Otherwise you would Again, you would have to get by on the bare necessities that uh, the government provided, which was which was sad. So yeah. those long lines for bread, for milk, for for anything were a hundred percent true. And those those I actually experienced when I came went back there when I was eighteen years old, and it was pretty sad to see. Yeah, it's it's interesting because that shows in my mind that there is a certain. First of all, th that whole drive to to do more, to accomplish more to provide for your family at a level that um, is beyond what you've you're being told is, is the, you know, cause like there's a capitalistic spirit that exists, I think in everyone, yeah you know, I think because we want that, right? Like we want that, we want more for our family or at least enough for our family. And when, when everybody's telling you that that's when the government, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, humans are hunter gatherers, right? Yeah. So they, they want to gather as much as possible when they can, and to store up for the hard times, right? Yeah. So, you, and you never know when a hard time is coming. So, therefore, you're always you're gathering <laughs> nonstop. It's, it's in our DNA. Right? Yeah, for sure. Which, which, uh, you know, some people have more talent than others, for sure. And circumstances make make a difference. What is your? I mean, we kind of got the backstory of how you got there. Like, as far as getting that entrepreneurial bug, what does that look like for you? Like, how did you decide? Okay, well, this is something I want to do for myself because you know, to to that point even though everybody has kind of that spirit, not everyone has the ability, right? You know, not everybody can actually be an entrepreneur because it's risk management. It's sure. lack of lack of fear in certain ways. It's it's ability to fail and, and get back up, all those things. Uh, yeah, what did that you, look like for you? Yeah, you definitely need to have a high degree of, of risk. Uh, you, you, you can't be you know, super risk avoid. You can't um, exercise a lot of risk avoidance because you, you never get a good off the ground. Uh, for me personally, um, as I was advancing in my computer career, I, I ended up getting a job at a consulting company or a, a really a staffing company where the staffing company would um, get contracts with large companies, in my case, in New York City, in Manhattan. And then they would go find the staff to go place on these projects. 
So if I was placed on a project to do some work, to do programming, and I'm just making these numbers up a little bit, they were charging, let's say, the customer $100 an hour for my time, and they were paying me $60 an hour for my time, making a $40 margin, mm -hmm. and which was fine at the time. But you know, as time went on, I'm like, these guys aren't doing anything. Okay, granted, <laughs> give them credit. They got me the job. Yeah. But they don't do, they don't add any value whatsoever other than collecting this margin. And the more I learned about this business, I'm like, That's, this is not that hard to do. I can go <laughs> find these customers. I can cut out the middleman. I can make that full building rate. Plus, I can provide a lot of value to the customers that these guys aren't doing, like project management, um, quality assurance, um, and a whole bunch of, you know, other things that this quote unquote staffing agency wasn't doing. And this, that's exactly what I did. And at the time, it was relatively easy because I didn't. I, we, I had, um, just got married, didn't have too many expenses. Um, I knew I can, even if I only found five or I'm not five, uh, even if I only found ten billable hours a week of work, I can you know make yeah. um, make, um, make the rent payment and the car payment. So it, I really didn't have you know too much to lose. And my fallback plan was, hey, you know what? I can just go get a job. If this doesn't work, I can get a job. Yeah. So. Oh uh, yeah, so that that's what it looked like for me, and it it worked. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice to have that fallback plan to say, you know, especially when you have, because a lot of times as entrepreneurs we have that skill set. It's like, well, you know, if I have to go get a real job, I'll go get a real job, right? Like that's, the, and sometimes we have to go through that journey for sure. So let's, I want you to walk me through um, kind of the the book you know stuff that you've got in there, and just how these endurance athletics really relate to our journey as entrepreneurs, right? Sure. Like there's, there's kind of this, but because I'm sure that it's, I'm sure it's well organized and you kind of go through that. So, it, you know, in as much time as you want, I'd love for you to just kind of walk through that without giving away the whole, you know, no spoiler alerts, but <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we still want to read the book, but yeah. Yeah. So basically what I found as I started embarking on all these endurance um, at journeys, I found that there's a lot of similarities, planning, Preparation and the book covers a lot of this. Yeah. So planning, preparation, execution, pivots, setbacks, stamina. You know, all of these. If I if I if I say those words, each of them can be applicable to endurance sports, and they're definitely applicable to entrepreneurship. Um, you know, the more stamina I started building um, in my endurance journey, the more stamina I had for the hard times um, in the business world. Mm. Uh, one of the biz biggest things that I point to, and there's a whole chapter on this, is about um, KPIs and reporting on data. When I started endurance sports, I started tracking a whole bunch of things, right? There's, you know, all these um, sports watches mm -hmm. and little computers that track your mileage, your pace, your heart rate, your calories in, your calories out, your distances. I started getting all these reports, and I'm looking at these reports, and I'm saying, wow, I have more data about my training and my races <laughs> than I have about my business. <laughs> yeah. Not that I didn't have any reports in the business world, but I felt that these were superior. So I created this entire initiative in, within the company to start doing a better job of tracking things. Mm -hmm. I met with every single department leader and we came up with a set of metrics that we were going to track on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. And we created a, an operating guide where we met, we would meet to get, um, every single month as a team. We would create a pretty little binder, you know, with sections for every single department. And instead of having just, you know, subjective, you know, status update um, amongst all the, all the members, we would actually be looking at numbers. And more mm. importantly, we'd be looking at how the numbers are trending and why they're trending in, in either positive or negative direction. So that just gave us so much more insight into every area of the business. And the more insight I got in the business, the more I started tracking in my endurance hobbies and vice versa. So they, they kind of, you know, they kind of fed on each other, right? Then the goals became bigger in the business. Mm -hmm. As my goals became bigger in endurance, like I went from sprint distance triathlon to Olympic to half Ironman to full Ironman. And then in the ultra marathon world, I went from marathon to 50K to 50 mile to 100K to 100 mile. Those goals kept growing. I'm like, why can't the goals in the company <laughs> start, <laughs> right. start, start getting bigger and bigger? So it, it kind of, it all feeds on each other. Yeah. The last part that I love to talk about with the book, and this is one of the final chapters, is called Envisioning the Finish. I'm a huge fan of manifestation mm -hmm. and envisioning things. The human mind doesn't tell, can't tell the difference between an, an event actually happening or an event expertly envisioned in one's mind. 
And you don't need to become a master meditator to do this. You can just watch a couple of YouTube videos, just like meditation 101 to, to learn how to envision something. When you do that, the human mind, the, the body just automatically programs itself to make certain decisions um, in order to accomplish what you just envisioned. And I can't tell you how powerful of a tool this was. I was doing this even before I knew what the word manifestation meant in the 90s. <laughs> All of, all of our clients at the time were in Manhattan. You know, all the buildings were skyscrapers. Every single sales call I'd go on, I'd pause at the door. I'd look up, close my eyes, and I'd say to myself, next time you're going to cross this threshold, this, this, this building is going to be a customer of yours or this customer, mm. this um, company. And it worked like 90% of the time. So, and then I fast forward when it came time to getting ready to sell the company, and also I was on this track to get to the Ironman World Championship. I did two things. I wrote a check out to myself for a very large amount of money, a specific number. And I printed out a poster of Kona Ironman World Championship and I hung them right here, right in front of my computer. And I saw it all day, every day. It was in my peripheral vision. I, I, I couldn't get away from it. So again, when your mind sees that, it automatically just does the right things, makes the right decisions in order to, you know, get to that proverbial finish line. Yeah. I have a, I have a piece of paper just cause I didn't print, I print, it's a color piece, but it's my, it's my vision board. Right. Which is, which Perfect. is kind of that is kind of that same concept, but I like the idea of writing. So the intention was that you were going to cash that check at some point. Is that the, is that the idea? Right. Yeah. It was, it was basically, um, yeah, it was for the amount of money that I wanted to sell the company for. I didn't take home all of it, obviously, because there's a whole bunch of expenses right. to yeah. place after an exit, um, which which many entrepreneurs don't really realize. So that's one of the many things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, when you say you sell your company for ten million dollars, you may get like two by the time by the time everything's it, done. It, it all depends. I mean, I highly advise folks to create what what I call this waterfall model. So you plug in a number at the top. You, obviously, you have to speak to your accountants to find out what the tax ramifications are of that number. And then there's all these, there's a million on one fees. There's legal fees, there's accounting fees, there's investment banker fees, there's consultant fees. Then there's your stock option plans and your other equity plans and your other contingency plans. And then there's state and local taxes and there's a million on one numbers, right? And then it comes down to what you, Mr. or Mrs. Entrepreneur get. Yeah. And people are blown away with the difference between the top <laughs> line and the bottom line. And then it really helps you set a proper goal for what that top line should be to make sure that the bottom line is enough. Yeah. Cause if your goal is this is if you have that goal in mind, right? Like if I want to get, let's say, just make it a round number. If I want to get a million dollars, there's a, there's a much larger number that I have to get out of the company in order right. for me to get that million dollar number. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's something I've never sold a company, but I know kind of the, a little bit of the ins and outs of it. But to your point about the middleman earlier, there's a heck, there's like 50 of them. In that, in that scenario right so every, everybody gets everybody gets a little bit of a cut um i think it's really cool that that you because i would think that in some cases a lot of entrepreneurs or business people or people in general will will kind of trade one for the other right like in your case you are excelling as an endurance athlete you've got these goals and so that it's very easy to trade those goals that energy, that drive, and then let your company ha not get that, right? We have a finite amount of energy and drive and all that. How did you like, first of all, I think it's super cool that you can do that, but how did you, how was your mindset around that um, in order to kind of keep those two, I call them parallel roads, right? Yeah, like yeah. in an entrepreneur's journey, I envision my road, my highway as like one of those Chinese 16, you know, 16 lane. And <laughs> yep. sometimes they weave and, and all that, but we really are, you know, multiple paths. Yeah. I mean, um, you know what? I, I just found a way um, to make it work. There was definitely sacrifices, you know, add in a family and two grown kids at, yeah. at the same exact time. Right. So there's definitely sacrifices that need to be made. There's, there's no doubt about it. And then don't forget, sleep is super important. Because without proper <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. We have to sleep, too. That's always right? people. I hate people to say, oh, I can get by in three hours of sleep. You know what? You're doing your body a massive disservice if you're getting yeah. by in three to four hours of sleep. You know, six to eight is really where, where you should be. Yeah. Um, ideally eight. Um, I just found a way to make it work. Um, a lot of people say that, you know what? I can't cut out television. I can't cut out social media or reading. Well, my answer is. Social media works when you're on the treadmill. Yeah. Um, 
You can, you know, you, you can be, you can watch Netflix when you're on a stationary bike. You can do the best. You can watch, you can listen to podcasts while you're swimming in the pool. There's a ton of inexpensive waterproof headsets that you can buy. Yeah. So you can, you don't really need to give up a lot of some of the extracurricular um, have hobbies that you currently have to train. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. I mean, I, I love TV just like everybody else. I love a whole bunch of other things which are, which may or may not be considered a waste of time. I can do that on my stationary bike. I can yeah. do that on a treadmill. <laughs> I was I was on a podcast all the time while swimming. So yeah. when you really want something, you figure out a way to incorporate that into your life. And in your case, you were able to weave those two scenarios into the business and you know, which I'm sure helped all of that data made your company way more sellable and way 100%. more attractive and, and more valuable because I don't think I don't think people track stuff in general. Like, I don't think people track their business right. I'm, I'm guilty of this. I, I'm falling to what you were doing, which is I, I'm much more likely to track my macros, to track my protein intake and my heart rate and all the, you know, my reps and personal lifting and all that stuff that I am, sure. you know, but if you look at my books, they're probably not up to the same level of snuff that they should be. Right. Uh, and so this is encouraging for me, for me to kind of do that. Yeah, there's, there's no, I agree with you. There's a large opportunity for most businesses to track things better. A quick anecdote on this. I'm helping a client sell their company right now, and we're talking to investment bankers. One investment banker said that another client of theirs presented, when they asked for their financial statements, they presented two reports, cash in and cash out. <laughs> That's it. And this was a $50 million company, five zero. Really? <laughs> All the owner cared about, am I making more money than I'm spending? Didn't care about anything else. I mean, right there and then, there's an opportunity for so much improvement and so much optimization if you just dig in deeper. He yeah. was just happy that he was making more than he was spending. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which is great if somebody wants to, you know, they'll assign a certain valuation to that, but it, it would probably be a tenth of what he would have had had he had actual reports. Oh, yeah, and, 100%. You know, yeah, showed all back, that. Back to your question about the book, another great chapter that I love, I... Um, the term ABC in the business world refers, refers to always be closing, mean, meaning business and mm -hmm. sales, right? Always be closing new business. I use the term ABC to always be closing your books. Mm. I wanted to make sure that our company was always ready for due diligence. So me, whether it would be a new banking relationship, a new partnership with a big player, a new um, investor, a potential sale. If you come up with a process to have your books in tip top shape at all times, you're going to increase the perception that a, a bank, a partner, or an acquirer is going to have because they're going to say, wow, these, these guys are all buttoned up. We ask for this stuff, which usually takes you know two months to get back. They give it back to us in two days. This is a buttoned up organization, and, and your, cred your credibility goes through the roof. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ironically, it, the, on Monday, I had my first meeting with my new – CPA slash fractional CFO guy. <laughs> He's like, well, here's what it's going to cost you because we have to go back 27 months for the last two years and, and clean up all your books, which is great. Like it's, I mean, it's, I'm glad I'm finally taking those steps, right. but he, he's the guy that I would say, Hey, I need this. I need this information. And he's like, well, go to your dashboard and print out this report and you'll have it. Right. And so that's something, and it's not really that expensive, even, you know, for right. a small company like mine, even for a bigger company, it really isn't, is it really isn't that, that expensive for sure. So you're married. I have, I have an interesting question for you. I've actually entered and in, interviewed three high level entrepreneurs this week, including yourself. And we talked about marriage. One of the things with maxed out man, we talk about the man, which is health and fitness and optimization, all that marriage, which is obvious. And then mission, which is some of what we're talking about legacy how to build your business, how to be profitable, all that. The marriage aspect I found really interesting because when you, if you described my wife and, and these other, and this is where the question come in, these other two gentlemen specifically, their wives and my wives, my wife are almost the same in terms okay. of like their makeup, their background, their fears, their worries, how they put up with us as entrepreneurs and all that. So I'm curious, like where you fall into that range, just for my own edification more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, my wife had a career. Um, um, she had a career of, of her own. Um, you know, we helped. We had help with our kids um, from from grandparents, from nannies, and all that. So she definitely pursued a career of, of her own, and she was always just incredibly supportive of my of my craziness. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the, these sports take a lot of time, and not only the training, but just you know, getting to the venue, getting to the race, 
recoup for in, especially like the mountain climbing trips. I mean, those are a, m- a month at, at a time. Wow. So she just has, she's been super, super supportive of all, all of these endeavors. And, um, you know, she, she enjoys going, I mean, she goes to a lot of them with me. So I try to pick venues, which we can turn into mini vacations. Yeah. Um, Ironman is a fantastic, I hate to sound like an Ironman commercial, but they have grown <laughs> so much that they have a race three different races every weekend, someplace in the world. Wow. So you can literally, you know, throw a dart at to their entire venue list mm-hmm. and pick an incredible destination to race at. And doesn't have any, doesn't need to be a full Ironman. It could be a half Ironman, which is a little bit easier. It's still hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they have other races as well because it's, it's turned into this ginormous racing um, um, or organization, you know, and then, then turn these races into like little mini vacations for the family, which I did, which made it a lot easier them to swallow yeah i'm sure is is she an athlete as well does she work out with you and kind of do shorter runs and that kind of thing i got her to do as long there was a philly 10 miler it was one of the races in philadelphia um that was the furthest i got her to go and she was one of these one and done like, yeah okay. <laughs> I, I've done it. My wife, my yeah. wife is super into Wonder Woman. So they have these one, these DC comics, like fun runs almost. Okay. And so she keeps signing us up for 10 Ks, which I'm totally fine with. So 10 Ks, I mean, dude, I could just go yeah. do it right now. It's it's That's easy. easy. If, if you're in any kind of shape at all, doing a 10 K is not that hard. Um, but yeah, she, she keeps signing us up because she likes the little medals that she gets. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, it, it's off camera here, but I, I've got a box of them. I mean, I've raced in probably you know fifty different events um, at this point. I mean, I I love. I'll be honest with you, and, and that's my one. That's from Kona right there. Oh, very cool. Kona, Hawaii, yeah, the big one. I'm, I I love collecting them. It's a great little you know keepsake to remind you of the of the challenge you you overcame. Yeah, because that's a snapshot, right? Like this is the snapshot because your memory. And your mind is like, when, when you look at that, I'm sure you can envision, you know, what looking at yourself from the outside, what you felt oh, yeah. during that time, hopefully forgotten a little bit of the pain, like, you know, like with childbirth, <laughs> but yeah. So, yeah. And, um, so if someone wanted to get started kind of down this journey with, with doing endurance athletics, like take someone like me, I've done a couple of marathons, a bunch of halves I've said, okay, I'm hanging it up, but maybe I would want to do something that's a, you know, a little bit more challenging for myself. I'm 51. Probably you're, you're kind of in that same age range. So that's no excuse clearly. Okay, um, I'm 54, no excuse. Yeah. So there's no excuses there. How do we like, what's your, what's your recommendation for kind of starting down that road? Yeah, it's really easy. I mean, if you want to go down the triathlon road, it's, it's definitely, I mean, again, this is coming from somebody that's done 17 full distance Ironman. So take yeah. a little bit of grain of salt, but it's not that hard to get started. I got my, I got my, both my daughters to do triathlons. I got my older daughter to do two New York city marathons with me and I got her to do a um, half Ironman. So, so she did it. Others can do it. Pick a sprint distance triathlon. There's one in every single, not every community, in most communities. I guarantee you, anybody listening, you probably don't need to drive more than two to three hours to a race. Go to beginner triathlete.com, find a local race in your area sprint distance the shortest one and then on that same site or on a million other sites get a training plan a training plan will tell you exactly how much you need to swim bike and run on a daily and weekly basis in order to prepare for for that event if you can afford it please get a get a coach you know get somebody Mm -hmm. or at least a training buddy you know somebody that's ideally has a little bit of experience under their belt this is an incredibly helpful community. Even on beginnertriathlete.com, every single year, um, they have these cohorts that form led by some, an experienced triathlete that just gives you know, free advice. Um, oh, there's a million and one Facebook groups. There's everybody just wants the community to flourish and to continue to grow. So you'd be amazed at how helpful the community is. So yeah, so my advice would be beginnertriathlete.com and pick a, pick a short race, Check it out, cross that finish line, and check see if you're one and done, or whether you want to go further. Yeah. And after that, there's an Olympic distance. Then after that, there's a half iron, then the full iron, and and believe it or not, there's actually longer distances than full Ironman. I just did something called Ultraman last weekend, which was the distances are ridiculous. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um because it becomes like, what's that next challenge, right? You can only do so many of the same thing before you're like, I need to challenge myself. Cause this is, it's not, it never gets quote unquote easy, right? but it's like, I'm not really 
going beyond my abilities. Like if my ability is to get through this and to keep getting faster or whatever, it's not really, you know, that much of a challenge, right? Yeah, some people want to push themselves and become faster, which is great. Um, my motto is not fast, not last. So I just <laughs> wanted to train enough to get through it because I love the journey as much. And I talk about this in my book as well. A lot of times the journey is just as important and just as much fun as the actual destination. Right. And for me, the journey of training, eating right, you know, staying healthy and getting to that starting line is as fun as starting and then finishing the actual race. So yeah. I personally love the journey. I don't do it to win. And so to further challenge myself, instead of getting faster, I just go longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause that's more sustainable. And I think really that's a great analogy for life or metaphor for life. It's like the, the it's, this is supposed to be fun mm -hmm. and you're supposed to enjoy it along the way. I had one friend that I worked with back in the day. And I remember him telling me like, I don't, we don't spend absolutely any money. We don't really do anything. We, because I'm plan and this, he was in his late twenties, early thirties at the time, because he was planning for retirement. Okay. Right. And I'm like, dude, what if you die at 45 and you literally have done nothing with your life other than go to work and put money in the bank, right? That's just, it's just as like, that's, what a waste. That's right? We don't sad. know how long we have, right? That, that, that's pretty sad. You, you have to live life uh, along the way. Yeah, for sure. I want to ask you one question. How yeah. should men, I, I wrote this down. I'm curious how you believe men should challenge themselves um, in life, business, marriage, all of these things, like, because that's something you do, right? So like, what is your recommendation for like what that looks like and why men don't challenge themselves is probably more accurate of a question. Cause that's something yeah, yeah. we see in our space a lot. It's like, you know, your biggest challenge is getting up to get more Doritos while you sit and watch football all weekend. <laughs> right. And so what is it that, what is it that men aren't doing and what should they be doing more of? I mean, I, th I think some people, I don't know what percentage of humanity are just happy with the status quo, right? They're happy with the job, happy with the relationship, happy with whatever hobbies they have or don't have. And they're fine with that, but there's just so much opportunity in this world to do more that I'm just a huge proponent of, you know, finding something that's going to get you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. That's another part of the book. It's called life, true learning and life really begins at the edge of your comfort zone. It's just so super exciting to go and accomplish something you didn't think was possible before. Um, yeah. The example I like to use is, you know, my wife's not into mountaineering like I am, but I got her to go onto a pretty advanced hike. It was hard. She, we were both, you know, huffing and puffing. We actually had a tour guide because we didn't know this trail. And we finally got to the top. It took like an hour and a half, two hours to get to the top of this hill in you know, upstate New York. And then she, she saw, we saw this incredible view of the Hudson River and all the foliage and the sights were just, and the, the look on her face, <laughs> if I could just, you know, capture that and put, put that into a pill, it was, she was euphoric, like, oh my God, this is incredible. So I translate that to a whole bunch of other things. People would be amazed in terms of like what they can possibly accomplish and how good it's going to make them feel. And um, in the in the process of setting, you know, slightly larger goals for yourself, I think you become a better person and mm -hmm. you encourage others to do the same. And now all of a sudden you're living in a community of folks or a group of friends that are, are trying to establish, you know, bigger and better goals for themselves. And the, the, the results will be phenomenal. So. Yeah. Cause then it's like that stair step, right? You just keep getting better and you have people in your world that, that are challenging you and making it more, um, like that, that euphoria, right? There's always this destination and there's only so many people that get to see some of these things that, right. that, you know, because we, have, we have a, I'm in Montana. So we have a ton of these hikes that lead to mountain lakes at sure. 6,000, 7,000 feet above sea level. Gorgeous. And there's just, you know, crystal clear water. You can see down, you know, down 50 feet, you know, or whatever, right to the bottom, but it may take us, you know, an hour and a half to get up there. But the reward is that then we get to sit and enjoy, you know, being with each other and enjoy being in nature and seeing something that people that can't make that hike or un are unwilling to make that hike literally will never see unless it's in a picture. Yeah. Yeah. And so hundred percent, a hundred percent. So again, life begins at the end, edge of your comfort zone. There's just so much cool things to do in this world. And it doesn't need to be like crazy physical, like my crazy endurance sports or getting to the top of a mountain. There's 
a lot of, and many of them are, are free. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I love it. I think that's a great place um, to land the plane. Tell me more like how we get to find, how we find the book. And I know it's been out, you said for about a month, right? Is that, it's so it's been, been out for at, a month. Um, yeah. I'm actually, it succeeded all my expectations. It hit number one the day it launched and it's still, still in the top 10 on the Amazon bestseller list. Wow. So it's called built to finish built to finish. You can find it on Amazon. Um, you can also go to my website, stephenpivnik.com. I like to blog about all my crazy adventures on my crazy races. So you can sign up for my blog at stephenpivnik.com and um, learn more about me, about my speaking gigs. Um, I love to get up on stage and just to motivate others to go set and achieve you know big goals. So happy to do that if anybody needs an inspirational speaker. Up yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And I'll put those, I'll put those in the show notes as well. So, Hey Ben, thanks so much for, um, for joining me and for like, give me, giving me some inf- inspiration today. Cause I, uh, you know, I'm actually inspired to think more about it. We'll see whether, <laughs> see if I can see if I can get my ass off the couch. You know, I don't really sit on the couch, but to get, you know, to go and challenge myself to do something along those endurance if you, athletics. If you can do a 10k, you can do a sprint triathlon. I'd oh, love yeah. to hear how, yeah. how you complete that. I'm definitely, I'm going to look into it for sure. All right, man. Thank All you, right. Kevin. Thanks, Appreciate Steven. It. Have a good day. Take care. If you're looking to really maximize your life and become the man you were made to be, head over to maxedoutman.com and get your journey started today.